Five, four, three, two, one. International Rescue are back on Radio 5. Thunderbirds are go. As far as I can see, London, nothing can save us short of a miracle. Thunderbird 1. F.A.B. Look, there are 600 people up there with about 40 minutes to live. As I thought, International Rescue are arriving on the scene. You called, milady? Yes, Parker. Get the Rolls Royce. Fire flash, overshoot, overshoot. We're not going to make it. We're running out of runway. Whatever happens, keep this frequency clear. Tonight's episode, Trapped in the Sky, introduced by Thunderbird's mastermind, Jerry Anderson. Shortly after the last war, I was conscripted into the Royal Air Force and was given a routine intelligence test. My marks were so low that I was given the option of joining the military police or working in a cookhouse. Later I was interviewed by the education officer. He asked me what I did in Civvy Street and I told him I worked in a film cutting room. And your wage? he asked snootily. Ten pounds a week, sir, I replied. That's about three hundred pounds in today's money. Judging by his reaction, it was obvious that my wage was higher than his. And after a lot of humming and ahhing, he agreed to allow me to go to RAF Cranwell to train as a radio telephone operator. And so I became involved in air traffic control and fell in love with all things to do with flying. I remember an aircraft coming to land with its wheels still up. Luckily it was warned off just as it was about to touch down. And I will never forget a mosquito aircraft that was giving an aerobatic display crashing and blowing up. Some years later, when I was working on pre-production of Thunderbirds, I recalled those two incidents, and together they helped me form the basic idea for the first episode. It's about an aircraft that couldn't land because it had a bomb in its undercart, and so it was trapped in the sky. rescue's first operation. John called from the space monitor, Thunderbird 5, and Father called us together in the lounge to tell us the news. The fire flash, the giant new atomic-powered aircraft with 600 passengers on board, was in distress at London Airport. Someone had placed a bomb in the landing gear before takeoff. As soon as the fire flash touched down, the explosives would smash the atomic reactor and blow the aircraft to pieces. And what's more, Tintin was on board on her way to join the international rescue team. I don't understand it. Something must be wrong. We're losing height. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? We have developed a minor technical fault and are returning to London. Please fasten your safety belts. Say, you're right. Oh, but I guess it's nothing to worry about. Well, I hope not. It's a very long way down from here. What are we going to do? I don't know. We can't reach the bomb. We can't land. And if we stay up here, we get radiation exposure. Whichever way you look at it, we don't stand a chance. They haven't got a chance. We've just got to sit here and wait for them to die. London Tower from Fireflash. Now circling at 30,000 feet. Radiation safety factor now, two hours. As far as I can see, London, nothing can save us short of a miracle. That's just what you might get. Okay, boys, that's the brief. It's our first assignment, so make it good. As you know, your uniforms are in your craft and must only be worn on call. Right, Father. Okay, Father. Sure thing, Dad. Yeah, Father. Okay, Scott. Away you go. And keep in touch. Yes, sir. Well, Brains, your phenomenal mind made all this possible. Now you're going to see it in operation. 
Well, good luck, Sky. Take it easy, Scott. So I got onto the revolving panel, at least a Thunderbird one, and I glided along the moving floorway to the door of the nose cone. Now, once I was in the pilot seat, I pushed the button that prepared the craft for launching. When Thunderbird one was sliding down the ramp into the launch pad, I knew that above me, the basin of the swimming pool was moving across to leave the gap above the launching area. Once I got there, I fired the motors, and Thunderbird 1 surged upwards into the daylight. International Rescue Space Station. This is Thunderbird 1. Give me the lowdown, John. Thunderbird 1 from Space Station. They're trying to dislodge the bomb by aerobatics, but they're not having much success. Well, from what you say, John, we're the only ones that can save them. We'd better bring up our heavy equipment. It looks like we're going to need it. I'll contact Father on the TV portrait. Go ahead, Scott. I'll be arriving at London Airport in 52 minutes. But it looks like I'll need heavy rescue. Okay, Scott. I'll organize that right away. Virgil, away you go. Right, Father. Well, Virgil went down to the heavy rescue hangar by the chute that drops him right into his chair in the cabin of Thunderbird 2. And while a massive cliff face was dropping away to reveal a hangar entrance, the pods containing the rescue machinery were slipping along the conveyor belt. When pod 3 had arrived under the aircraft, the tall legs of Thunderbird 2 retracted and the craft sank on top of it. Then Virgil rolled his machine forward to its ramp. Fired the rockets. And in seconds he was airborne. On his way to join me. But by now I was well on my way to London Airport. In the rescue business, speed is all important. And my Thunderbird is capable of reaching phenomenal speeds. I guess in the London control tower, they could hardly believe their eyes when they picked me up on their radar screens. Aircraft approaching from the east, high 2,500 feet. Speed 7.5 thousand miles per hour. 7.5 thousand miles an hour? Have you gone crazy? London Tower, this is International Rescue. Fireflash is in trouble and we are equipped to help you. Request permission to land. International Rescue? What is this? That must be the aircraft I just picked up. This I must see. International Rescue, you are clear to land. Use runway 29. Will not require runway, coming in vertically. London Tower from International Rescue. Now listen carefully. I want men and transport to take my portable equipment to your control tower, and I want an assurance from you that you will place guards on my aircraft to ensure that no photographs are taken. International Rescue, please give me information about your organization. We cannot grant facilities without knowing more details. Look, there are 600 people up there with about 40 minutes to live. Now, you can't help them, but I believe we can. Now, what's it going to be? All right, International Rescue, but I just hope you know what you're doing. I guess the airport controller knew that there was no time for argument. The situation was now desperate. Already one attempt to save Fireflash had been made. They had winched a man from another aircraft into the wing of the Fireflash in an attempt to dismantle the bomb. But when he got there, he lost his grip and fell out through the open hatch. The controller was as good as his word. In seconds, the runway was swarming with police cars that converged on Thunderbird 1. But somehow the saboteur, the guy who had put the bomb in the fire flash, had got amongst them posing as a police officer and with a camera concealed in the badge of his cap. As I thought, international rescue are arriving on the scene. Part two of my plan about to commence. <laughs> Now, 
let's recap. Fireflash had another 30 minutes before its radiation safety factor expires. Right. Now, the specialized gear that I require for the rescue will be here in 20 minutes, leaving us just 10 minutes to put our rescue into operation. Thunderbird 2, this is mobile control. Confirm estimated time of arrival, London Airport. Okay, Scott. Arriving in 19 and one half minutes from now. Now, as soon as you arrive, unload high-speed elevator car with two radio control subsidiaries. Then proceed to end of runway 29 and report. Thunderbird 1, FAB. Fireflash, this is International Rescue Mobile Control. In approximately 18 minutes from now, I will request you to land using runway 29. You are to come in with landing gear up. Repeat, landing gear up. Make a completely normal approach and keep your head. No. To make sure that no one takes photographs of Thunderbird 1. Except me, of course. <laughs> The automatic camera detector, quick! Someone photographing the instrument panel of Thunderbird 1. It's imperative that you get this man and stop him! Airport police, this is the control tower. Someone is taking photographs inside the International Rescue Aircraft. Grab him and bring him in for questioning. This is Thunderbird 2, approaching London Airport. Okay, Virgil, you're clear to land. The airport is closed to all traffic during this emergency. FAB, touching down on end of 2-9. London Tower from Airport Mobile Police. We have lost contact with pursued car. The vehicle was last seen turning on to M1, heading towards Birmingham. Message received and understood. I'm sorry. We did our best. Okay. Leave this to me. calling International Rescue, England. International Rescue. Lady Penelope speaking. Require your assistance. Man with photographic records of Thunderbird 1 proceeding along M1 motorway in your direction. Car registration 695CMO. Over. Mobile control. FAB. Oh dear, how inconvenient. Just as I'm expecting visitors. Three coach loads, too. Oh, well. You called, milady? Yes, Parker. Get the Rolls Royce. We are going for a little drive. So, Lady Penelope, with Parker at the wheel of her Rolls Royce Fab One, speeded towards the motorway in hot pursuit. Before the fire flash, time was running out. The pilot's voice sounded grim when he radioed through to me in the airport control tower. Mobile control from fire flash. We have only five minutes left. Unless you can stop rescue operation immediately. We've had it. Stand by, fire flash. Thunderbird 2 from mobile control. Are you ready, Virgil? Mobile control and fire flash. This is Thunderbird 2. I'm ready. Virgil was seated at the controls of his master elevator car, which he drove out of the plot. Behind him came two other elevator trucks, which he could control by remote radio. Each of the three machines had a massive flat roof cushioned by powerful springs. When Virgil told me he was in position at the start of the runway, I radioed the Fireflash pilot with final instructions. Control the Fireflash. Commence your approach, and good luck. After acknowledgement of this transmission, do not make any further calls. Whatever happens... 
Keep this frequency clear. Roger, Control. Starting approach now. Aircraft approaching glide path five miles to threshold. Stand by, Virgil. Fire flash on final approach. Virgil waited in the master elevator car for me to give the final go-ahead. In the control tower, the radar operator was describing the fire flash's final approach. Aircraft on glide path. Three and one half miles to threshold. Stand by, crash tenders. Crash tenders to center of runway 29. Roger. Stand by, Virgil. Fire flash one and one half miles from threshold. One and one quarter miles from threshold. One mile from threshold. Start tracking. Mobile control, FAB. Fire flash 700 yards from threshold. Air speed 130 knots. Increase to 108. FAB. As Virgil's three elevator trucks raced along beneath it, the fire flash dropped lower and lower. With utmost concentration, the entire team used all their skill and precision to bring the vehicles into exactly the right position for exactly the right moment. Okay, fire flash. Cut engines. As the massive aircraft was about to rest on the trucks, a fault developed in one of them. Fire flash. Overshoot. Overshoot. Virgil backtracked to the starting point and brought out of the pod the fourth and last elevator car and the whole operation was started again. Okay, here we go. And this time, it's the last time. Aircraft approaching glide path. Four miles to threshold. Stand by, Virgil. Fire flash on final approach. Okay, Scott. Standing by. On glide path. Rate of descent, 500 feet a minute. Aircraft on glide path. Three miles to threshold. Stand by, crash tenders. Crash cruise to center of 2-9. Runway ahead, two miles. Fire flash now one mile from threshold. Start tracking. Mobile control. FAB. Fire flash 500 yards from threshold. Air speed 120 knots. Increase to 105. 105. FAB. So the mighty fire flash with its crew and passengers of 600 came roaring down towards the runway. Ahead of it raced Virgil's three elevator cars. Gradually, the fire flash came into a position directly above the cars. One wing over each of the radio cars and a massive fuselage over Virgil's master car. With barely a yard separating the cars from the fire flash, Virgil shouted a command to the fire flash pilot. Fire flash from Thunderbird 2. Cut engines. The port wing of the fire flash suddenly dropped dangerously near the ground. Lift port wing. Lift port wing. The engine sprang to life, and the wing rose just enough for the radio truck to race into position beneath it. Cut power. Okay, fire flash, reverse thrust. The fire flash was now totally supported by the three elevator cars. But by now, they were running out of runway. I'm applying brakes down here. We're not going to make it. We're running out of runway. Hold tight, Fire Flash. Applying maximum brakes. The strain on the elevator cars was colossal. were exploding. And finally, the master elevator car with Virgil inside it slewed off course. With a mighty bump, fireflies dropped to the ground, and there was a terrific display of sparks as the aircraft scraped down the last few yards of runway. With only feet to go, the giant liner drew to a halt. For a ghastly moment, we held our breath. Would the impact affect the bomb inside the wing? But all was well. 
the bomb did not explode. They made it. They made it. Jolly good show, old boy. And what a show. Well, how can we ever thank you? Well, I tell you, it's essential for the reason I explained to you that our organization remains top secret. I want you to contact your authorities and make sure that there are no aircraft within a hundred mile radius when we leave and their assurance that we will not be tracked. Whatever happens, secrecy must be maintained at all costs. Oh, I do my best. But talking of secrecy, how about that character who photographed your aircraft? Don't worry. You'll be taken care of. We're closing in on him, lady. Good, Parker. Wait till we get to a clear stretch of road. We don't want to create a scene. Very good, lady. Go ahead, Parker. Yes, milady. Thank you, madam. Home, milady. Home, Parker. It looked like that guy wasn't going to give us any more trouble. The roll of film containing the photographed secrets of international rescue could not possibly survive that wreck. My pictures. They are ruined. Someone will pay for this. International Rescue haven't heard the last of me. You've been listening to Trapped in the Sky. Brought to you by Jerry Anderson with help from his fan club, Fanderson. The series was produced for Radio 5 by Christopher Aldrich. Coming up next week on Thunderbirds, End of the Road. Eddie, can you hear me? No word for half an hour. You'd better try again. Eddie, this is Bob. Call in. Call in. Oh, God. I guess we'll have to... Hi, Bob. This is Eddie. They've planted the charges. Eddie! Then get out of there! That peak's cracking up! There'll be a landslide any minute! But I guess I'd better fire the charges now. You'll be too close! Get away from there! You kill yourself! The company isn't worth it! Eddie! Eddie, can you hear me? And he cut off! He cut off! ETA 5 past 8 on Radio 5 FAB Line 3 AM National Network Radio This is BBC Radio 5 4 3 2 1 International Rescue are back Radio 5. Thunderbirds are go. Rock ball. Rock ball. Reverse back. Reverse back. Eddie Houseman. Hey, Father, he knows us. Take a look at this. The instruments are picking up earth tremors in the mountains. What? But if we go through with this job, we're going to break our cover. If you weren't blown to bits, you'll be buried alive. Take it easy. He's slipping. We can't hold her. She's going. Get away from there. You kill yourself. The company isn't worth it. Eddie, Eddie, can you hear me? Tonight.
tonight's episode, End of the Road, introduced by Thunderbird's mastermind, Jerry Anderson. Things aren't always what they seem to be. This is a notion that has always fascinated me and which I've used in all of my series. In Stingray, Agent X20's lounge could be turned into a control room at the touch of a button. Shadow headquarters in UFO was located deep in the bowels of the Earth under a film studio. And in Thunderbirds, the exotic island home of the Traces concealed the nerve center and launch pads of the international rescue. Today's story includes Operation Cover-Up. When any unexpected guests arrived at the island, all traces of Thunderbird operation disappeared at the touch of a button. As a child, I had what might be described as an overactive imagination. I came from an extremely poor family and we lived in one room at the top of a big house in Kilburn. At this point, the filmmaker in me wants to bring in the violins. But the reason for me telling you this is because I think the lack of material things in my childhood helped to develop my imagination. A cotton reel, for instance, will quickly transform in my mind into a steamroller and become a treasured toy. In today's story, Eddie Houseman is saved by international rescue. And although he is an old friend of the Tracys, he never finds out that they are international rescue. For Eddie, things are certainly not what they appear to be, particularly when he gets to the end of the road. It's clearing! We're through! Bang on schedule! Great! Congratulations, Mr. Halsman. Thanks, boys. There'll be a good bonus for this. Okay, let's go take a look. Get back to base. Oh, hello there. Welcome to Brain's Laboratory. I'm just running through some videotapes of international rescue operations. You just heard the start of what turned out to be a very tricky rescue indeed. We call it the end of the road. And it was just about that for Eddie Hausman, who was trapped in a precariously balanced explosives truck. You see, the Gray and Hausman Construction Company had been contracted to complete a through road in mountainous and jungle choke terrain. And they were racing against time, uh, trying to complete the work before the start of the monsoon season. Let's go back and join them before the trouble really starts. Eddie, you did wonders. I never thought you'd get through the mountain this side of the monsoons. Oh, with any luck, we're going to make that date. Well, Eddie, you played your part. Now I'll play mine. Providing I can get that road finished before the rains, we'll be okay. Yeah, I, I guess it's over to you now. You just go off and enjoy your vacation. And don't worry. Oh, by the way, uh, where are you going to? Anywhere special? I just... Uh... Looking up an old friend. Aircraft approaching the island. 
Sounds like it's coming in the land. It is coming in the land. Operation Cover-Up. Operation Cover-Up involves putting an everyday front on the Tracy household. It had been designed for just such an emergency. I had rigged up a control panel which hid all trace of the international rescue setup. For example, uh, the large wall pictures of the Tracy boys in uniform were covered by other photographs of them in everyday clothes. All the communications equipment slid into recesses to be replaced by innocent-looking ornaments. Of course, John was advised to use the secret communications channel in the event of a rescue operation call when visitors were on the island. I wonder who it can be. Well, whoever it is, I hope they don't stay long. Yeah, could be kind of awkward if we get an emergency call. A uh, gentleman to see you, Mr. Tracy. Uh, Mr. Eddie Hausman. Eddie? Eddie Hausman. It seemed that Eddie and Tintin had been at school together. And he had stopped off to say hello on his way back to the road camp after his vacation. However, a call from Bob Gray cut short his stay with the traces. According to the weather reports, we're just going to make it. The rains are doing about two days. Yeah? Now take a look at this. The instruments are picking up earth tremors in the mountains. What? How bad are they? Hard to tell. Signals are faint, but that doesn't mean a thing. Let's go take a look for ourselves. Monsoon will bring that whole range down into the cutting we've made. We'll never finish the road on time now. We can't give up now, Bob. We can't. Eddie, it's too late. The rains have started. And what do we do? Just sit here? Let a landslide ruin all our work to date? That's what we do. And then in the spring? In the spring? That means we'll lose our contract. We'll just have to try and get an extension, that's all. Extension? Why, the only reason we got the contract was because we gave an early completion date. There's no other way, Eddie. That's where you're wrong. There's one way. Let me take a gang of men up there. With carefully placed Newtomic chargers, I could blast the peak and make it fall away from the road instead of into it. You couldn't do it. Try me. Eddie! The seismograph shows that peak could collapse at any second. And even a small slide could cause the charge to explode while you were working on them. If you weren't blown to bits, you'd be buried alive. I know my job. And I know mine. And since I'm the senior partner, I say we apply for the extension. It'll break us. Maybe. But you'll be alive. Look, I'm not going to argue. The decision is made. It looked like the end of their dreams. Uh, but Eddie was a stubborn guy. He decided to go it alone. So once everyone was asleep, he crept down and loaded some Newtonic charges aboard the explosives tractor. The noise of the tractor leaving disturbed Bob Gray. But by the time he had gathered his thoughts, Eddie was well on his way. They tried to contact him on the audio phone. Hello, Eddie. Eddie, can you hear me? No word for half an hour. You'd better try again. Eddie, this is Bob. 
Call in. Call in. Oh, God. I guess we'll have to... Hi, Bob. This is Eddie. I've planted the charges. Eddie! Then get out of there! That peak's cracking up! There'll be a landslide any minute! And I guess I'd better fire the charges now. You'll be too close! Get away from there! You kill yourself! The company isn't worth it! Eddie! Eddie, can you hear me? He cut off! He cut off! Yeah, I can hear you. You did it! You're okay! Eddie, the cutting's in no danger now. We can see from here. Bob, listen. The blast took my tractor right to the edge. I can't get out. If I move to the door, the thing will overbalance. Okay, keep calm, Eddie. We're on our way. There's worse to come. I've still got a case of mutomic charges on board. If this goes over the edge, I'm going to be blown sky high. Oh, boy. What a spot to be in. This was one situation the construction company wasn't equipped to handle. Time was also against them. Uh, at any second, the tractor could slip off the edge to disaster. Suddenly, Bob remembered International Rescue. Uh, within seconds, John in Thunderbird 5 had picked up the SOS. That's right. You get the picture? That you can't reach the tractor because of the state of the ground. The explosions cut the ground up so bad, we just didn't chance our weight on it. Okay, Mr. Gray, we're on our way. I told him we'd be there, Father. I hope I did right. Of course you did right, son. What's that supposed to mean, anyway? I left the name of the guy who was going to be rescued to laugh. Why? Who is it? Eddie Hausman. Eddie Hausman? Hey, Father, he knows us. That's right, Scott. Eddie knows us. That means we can't help? Is that what you're saying, Dad? No, Alan. But if we go through with this job, we're going to break our cover. And we all know how essential it is that this outfit remain secret. What do we do? Turn this call down? No, John, we don't turn down any call. We've done everything we could to hide our identity, but not at the risk of wasting a life. Carry on, Scott. Yes, sir. As usual, the Thunderbird craft were standing ready on their launching pads. The nuclear engines of the machines were charged to allow up to six months flying time. Scott entered his machine via the moving ramp which connected the Tracy Lounge directly with the nose cone of Thunderbird 1. As the free launch checks were carried out, he changed into his duty uniform. Then the craft slid gently down the ramp onto the launch pad. Within a matter of seconds, Thunderbird 1 blasted up through the hole where the swimming pool had been but a few moments before and was off to the rescue area. International rescue from Thunderbird 1. Changing to horizontal flight. As Thunderbird 1 reached top speed, Mr. Tracy was completing his instructions to Virgil and Allen. Okay, Virgil, that's the brief. Use the magnetic grabs. Allen can help you on this one. Any questions? No, sir. No, sir. Away you go. Good luck. The enormous bulk of Thunderbird 2 dwarfs the other craft 
uh, and understandably so, as this is the freighter ship of the International Rescue Fleet. All the heavy rescue gear is stored in six pods in the hangar. And once Virgil has selected the required equipment, the gigantic hull of Thunderbird 2 settles over the pod and the entire unit then proceeds to the launching ramp. So, Virgil made his way directly to the flight deck by means of the chute, again connecting the Tracy Lounge to the craft. Now, as he did so, Alan entered the machine by means of the passenger elevator. As you all know, Thunderbird 2 is housed behind a sheer cliff face which slides away mechanically to allow the craft onto the ramp. Virgil eased his giant charge onto the ramp, the launch procedure was carried out, and they were airborne with a deafening roar. Meanwhile, back at the camp, things were getting desperate. International Rescue, come in, please. Nah, it's no good. I can't reach him. Thunderbird 1, in rescue area. Come in, Thunderbird 1. Come in. Listen, rescue area. It'll be a few more minutes before Thunderbird 2 gets here. I'm going to try and do something about those boulders. Okay, check. But I don't know what you can do. We were going to try and build a barrier. We haven't got the necessary gear. Well, we have. So here goes. Although the bulk of the rescue equipment is always carried in Thunderbird 2, Scott in Thunderbird 1 has a few emergency tricks up his sleeve. A part of his equipment includes a battery of high tensile spear firing tubes. He let loose a salvo which thudded firmly into the rock face, and these acted as a protective screen against the falling boulders. Wow! Did you see what I saw? A machine. And here comes another one. Thunderbird 2 from Thunderbird 1. We're glad to see you, fella. Now, here's the situation, Virgil. I've laid down a steel screen to stop any boulders from knocking the tractor over the edge. Now lower your crafts and pick it up. F.A.B., Scott. Okay, Alan. Okay, Scott. I'm coming in now. And so, Virgil began the tricky task of maneuvering Thunderbird 2 into a canyon not much wider than his wingspan. With Scott's help, he reached a position immediately over the tractor, and then... Hey, pull away, Virgil. Your vertical jets are tipping it over. What are we going to do, Scott? We'll have to go in closer if we're going to make contact with the grabs. Now, we've got to think of a way of stabilizing that tractor while the grabs are attached. Scott, couldn't they fix a line that would hold it steady? No, Virgil, I'm sure that's not possible. The ground near the tractor is so badly cracked that even a small increase in weight could tip that balance. Hey, wait. I've got an idea. Now, if this works, Virgil, come straight in and grab him. Scott's turn for some tricky flying. Uh, being smaller, Thunderbird 1 was able to negotiate the canyon more easily. But Scott had to get to a position with his nose angled toward the canyon walls and underneath the precariously balanced tractor. He then held the tractor up while Virgil tried again. Okay, Virgil, come in now. I'll take the strain. F.A.B. Coming in now. Okay, Scott. We've got it. It 
looked like plain sailing from then on, but... It's too heavy for the grabs. We're not going to hold it. Easy, Virgil. Take it easy. He's slipping. Oh, sorry about that. I, I guess I... I got kind of carried away. Virgil, hold her steady. Eddie's jumping for it. Eddie leapt onto the mountainside at the first opportunity. Okay, Virgil, he's clear. Now get the tractor to level ground so we can get to the atomic charges. FAB, Scott. But now, there were only two grabs supporting the tractor. Virgil reached Thunderbird 2 as swiftly as possible from the scene, heading for open country. It was touch and go all the way, but he made it. Nearly there. We can't hold her. She's going! The tractor finally broke free and plummeted earthwards. the road, Eddie. You saved the road. Did I? You ask me, International Rescue did all the saving around here. I'm sure looking forward to thanking those guys. Doesn't look as though you're gonna get a chance. Thunderbirds were heading for home. Thankful for their successfully accomplished mission. Uh, and pleased that the security of the International Rescue Organization had been maintained. Listening to End of the Road, brought to you by Jerry Anderson with help from Century 21, the official Jerry Anderson magazine. The series was produced for Radio 5 by Christopher Aldridge. Coming up next week on Thunderbirds, Sun Probe. Well, folks, the Sun Probe has been fired. The tension here in the studio mounts as we await further news. Sun Probe going through flare now. Standing by to fire remote control rockets. Three, two, one, fire. Please stand by for a news flash. We are going over to Colonel Benson at the Solar Control Center for an important announcement. All efforts to alter the spaceship's course by firing their retros by radio beam from Earth have failed. Now I have a vital request to make. If International Rescue are watching, would they please communicate at once with Solar Control Center, Cape Kennedy? I repeat, this is vital. International Rescue, we need your help. That's next Monday, ETA 5 past 8, on Radio 5, FAB. Radio five, four, three, two, one. International Rescue are back on Radio Five. Thunderbirds are go. Stand by, commencing the final countdown. The tension here in the studio mounts as we await further news. It's coming out. She's turning. Stand by for blast off. Get me Cape Kennedy. Solar module for Thunderbird 3. Where are you? Can we stand the increased heat and radiation? On paper, no. Well, there's still time. Before we melt to nothing, the fire retros, Alan, it's getting unbearable. I have, but they're not working. Alan, we're still on a collision course with the sun. <laughs> Tonight's episode.
episode, Sun Crow. Introduced by Thunderbird's mastermind, Jerry Anderson. Isn't it strange that all these years after the Thunderbird series episode, Sun Probe, was made, I should find myself talking about it just as the first probe to take a close look at our sun has been launched from the American Space Shuttle. I found this a very difficult story to film. It was not an easy subject to bring to the screen. Shot after shot, Thunderbird 3 was shown closer and ever closer to the sun. Or, put it another way, the sun was forever getting bigger and bigger. I spent many nights in the cutting room trying to ensure the story came across clearly. In the end, I remember telling the editor we couldn't do any more and going home in despair. There's an old Hollywood saying, if it's bad, make it loud. I told our dabbing editor to make it loud. Our special effects were always excellent, but no matter how good they were, they always looked so much better with good sound effects or good music. Next time you watch a special effects picture on television, try turning the sound off and you'll see what I mean. Eventually the episode came to our screens and much to my surprise, most people told me how much they enjoyed it. Don't be put off this week's episode called Sunbro just because I didn't like it. I didn't like Star Wars when it first came out either. Thunderbird 3 calling Earth. This is Alan Tracy in outer space. I am en route to Thunderbird 5 with spares and stores for John. And I've been watching a video show recalling the news highlights of 2065. One flashback has just come up, which was nearly the end for Thunderbird 3. We called it Operation Sun Probe. The Solar Control Center at Cape Kennedy, after years of preparation, was set to launch their greatest project ever, a spaceship was to be sent into close orbit around the sun in order to fire a probe and literally bring back a piece of the sun for examination by the world's scientists. The spacecraft was over 600 feet long and crewed by three astronauts. Because of the intense heat, the crew were protected by 20-foot thick stainless steel walls and fantastic refrigeration equipment. The probe was designed to fly through one of the sun's greatest prominences, or mountainous flames which constantly flare up from the surface to heights of 300,000 miles and more. When the probe had collected its material, special braking rockets were designed to bring it back to unite with the parent craft. At this stage, we of International Rescue were just a few among the millions of fascinated video viewers. Little did we know that we would soon be deeply and dangerously involved ourselves. Stand by, Solar Module. 13 seconds. Commencing final countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Full power. film, folks, show the launching of the Sun Probe. With me in the studio is Professor Heinz Bodman, who is going to explain just how the Sun Probe project will operate. Good evening. Say, where's Brains? Doesn't he want to hear all this? Ah, this is old stuff to him, Father. He's in his workshop playing around with his latest invention. Uh, now, Brayman, I'm gonna test your uh, secretarial characteristics. Now, tell me, what are my appointments for the day? Don't you want to watch Operation Sun Probe, Brains? I I'd prefer to fix Brayman, Mr. Tracy. He's still far too impulsive. But Brains... 
They're going into orbit in five minutes. Four and one quarter minutes to be precise, Mr. Tracy. Say, you know the sun probe routine by heart. You're not as blasé as you act. Oh, no, sir. <laughs> well, you could have fooled me. Orbital path. Ten seconds. Right. Stand by. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Retros. Great. We're on correct orbit. Check radiation and temperature levels. Temperature, A-OK. -okay. Radiation, A-OK. -okay. 20 seconds to firing time for probe. All systems on probe are green. 10 seconds. Firing controls are go. Five seconds. Four. Three. Two. One. Ignition. Well, folks, the sun probe has been fired. We will give you all the details as they are received from the spaceship. Attention here in the studio mount as we await further news. Sun probe going through flare now. Standing by to file remote control rockets. Five seconds. Four. Three. Two. One. Fire. It's coming out. She's turning. We've made it. Great. Let's get that probe. And then, back to Earth. Yes, it looked like all was going well. The probe had done its job and had been relinked with the parent ship. But they couldn't fire their retro rockets. Brains calculated that the intense radiation level caused by the close proximity of the sun had interfered with the craft's control system. Sun probe was on a collision course with the sun. Please stand by for a news flash. We are going over to Colonel Benson at the Solar Control Center for an important announcement. All efforts to alter the spaceship's course by firing their retros by radio beam from Earth have failed. Now I have a vital request to make. If International Rescue are watching, would they please communicate at once with Solar Control Center, Cape Kennedy? I repeat, this is vital. International Rescue, we need your help. Get me Cape Kennedy. Yes, sir. Very well, Colonel Benson. We'll attempt a rescue. But this is a tough one. You can say that again. Anyway, good luck. Let's go over it once again. The sun probe rocket is heading straight into the sun. And unless we can fire the retros to make the rocket turn round, those three solar knots are doomed. Well, uh, Mr. Tracy, the only solution is for us to fire the retros by radio beam. Well, a radio complex in Thunderbird 3 would seem the obvious choice. But Scott, the transmission range of Thunderbird 3 isn't powerful enough. I think Thunderbird 2 transmitter would stand a much better chance. Well, Mr. Tracy, I think we may be underestimating the heat and radiation resistances of our uh, spacecraft. But the transmission potential of Thunderbird 2 could certainly be tremendous. Right. We'll launch a two-prong rescue attempt. First of all, we've got to get Thunderbird 3 launched as soon as possible. When do you think that could be, Brains? Well, the radio equipment will have to be modified, but I should think launching could take place soon after sunup. Right. Go and organize that now, Brains. Virgil, you better go to the computer room and work out what point is best for Thunderbird 2 to project a safety beam towards the sun probe. Okay, Father. 
Father, we'll need an extra crew member to operate the safety beam. All right, Alan, you'd better take Tintin along with you. Launching takes place at 0800 hours. <laughs> You know what to do? Yes, Father. Let's hope it works from that distance. It's got to. It's as close as you dare go. Good luck, all of you. While I was preparing Thunderbird 3, Virgil and Brains had boarded Thunderbird 2 and taken off for their destination, Mount Arkin in the Thimalayan Range, one of the coldest spots on Earth, but the nearest point of the solar ship from which to operate with any hope of success. Their job was to project a safety beam towards Sun Probe to work in conjunction with the one from Thunderbird 3. It was a long shot, but given luck, it would work. Eventually, it was time to go, and I joined Tintin and Scott on the couch in our lounge, which transports us directly to the control cabin of Thunderbird 3. The couch sank through the floor and was immediately replaced by the empty one from below, so the room looked as if it had never been disturbed. Down and down we went until the couch came to rest on the bogey truck below. Then along raced the truck until it came to rest beneath the towering hull of Thunderbird 3. Up again on a hydraulic jack until we were firmly settled in the control cabin. Stand by for blast off. the tremendous upward surge which pinned us to our reclining takeoff couches, we were carried upward through the roundhouse which disguises the entrance to Thunderbird 3 hangar. We were on our way to the sun. Well, there's still time. We've got a whole day before... Before we melt to nothing, why doesn't Earth do something? Solar module from International Rescue. Do you read me? Now I'm hearing things. I thought that was the radio. Come in, solar module. This is International Rescue. It is the radio. <laughs> Can you help us? We hope so. We're going to try to fire your retros from space. Operating safety beam now. Negative. We're four hours short. Four hours? But that means we'll have to go much closer to the sun than was estimated. It looks like it. Can we stand the increased heat and radiation? On paper, no. But we can't just abandon those three guys. We sure have a problem. How's the beam situation? All set. Transmitting safety beam now. Well, Brains, what's the position? It's a very powerful beam we're sending up, but not as yet quite powerful enough. Is there anything we can do? Oh, yeah. Once I have modified the tripartite transistor packs and made a, a few adjustments to the wiring, we can try again. Okay, while you're doing that, I'll fix us some hot coffee. I can't stand the heat. So hot. Are you sure you can't get any more out of the refrigeration plant? No, nothing's working anymore. Where's that rescue ship? It's nearly four hours since we're in contact with them. It's still short. Can't you increase the power, Tintin? I can overrun the system up to about 0.5. Then do that, will you? 
just can't go any closer. It was now or never. I just couldn't risk taking Thunderbird 3 any nearer the sun. Already there were signs of stress on the instruments and hull. Also, Tintin sounded just about all in. Rocket motors. They fired. Asher, Cam, we're leaving the sun. We're gonna live. Okay, the solar ship's out of danger. Let's head for home. Just in time, I guess. I couldn't have said much more of this heat. Fire retros. Well, fire retros, Alan. It's getting unbearable. I have. But they're not working. Alan, we're still on a collision course with the sun. Hello, Mother. Virgil, bad news about Thunderbird 3. What's happened? Alan succeeded in saving the sun probe. But now it seems the retros have failed on Thunderbird 3... And they're heading straight for the sun. Straight for the sun? Brains! What are we going to do? What are we going to do? If it is the case that the uh, beam transmitter is still operating... Yes? We could perhaps, only perhaps, mind you, neutralize the transmitter on Thunderbird 3. Great! What's the frequency? I don't know, but I, I could probably uh, work it out on the mobile computer I in Thunderbird 2. Okay, let's get to it. Uh, that's it, Virgil. Right. Open it up, and we'll work out the formula for the transmitter. Raymond. Oh, no! Virgil, we brought the wrong box. It's no use, Virgil. There's nothing we can do. Listen, couldn't you work out the formula on paper? I, I only wish I could, Virgil. But you see, without a computer, it would take weeks. But if you could work out the details of Brayman's mechanics without a computer, surely you could do... Brayman? Th th that's it. He's our only hope. Well, let's get on with it, Brains, for Pete's sake. Now, uh, Brayman, I want you to calculate the following equation. What is the square root to the power of 29 of the trigonometric amplitude of 87 divided by the quantitative hydraxis of 956 to the... Uh, Power of 77. Do you understand the question? Yes. Off you go then. Now. Come on, Brian. Come on. Do you think it's going to work? Got to. It's got to. Well, uh, Brian? 45,969. It worked, Brains. It worked. I only hope it's right. Come on. International Rescue calling Virgil at Mount Arkham. This is International Rescue Base calling Thunderbird 2. Base from Thunderbird 2. Base from Thunderbird 2. Loud and clear, Virgil. Where are you? I'm sorry, Father. We just heard your signal as we came back from the pod. Listen, Father, it's our only hope. We haven't got time to explain, but Brains is going to try to jam Thunderbird 3's transmitter. Ready, Brains? Yeah. I'd line the transmitter up. Right. Go.
day. The retros must have fired. We're moving away from the sun. We're moving away from the sun. Virgil, uh, something's happening. I I'm getting a reading from Thunderbird 3. Yeah, me too. It can mean only one thing. The retros. Yeah, they fired. The retros have fired on Thunderbird 3. Yes, brains came through just in time. We were convinced we were beyond help. At least if we'd been conscious, that would have been our thought. It says a lot for Brains' engineering genius that Thunderbird 3 stood up to the tremendous heat. Of course, we also have a very soft spot for Brayman since that particular rescue. Well, I'm approaching Thunderbird 5 now. Thanks for joining me on the trip. See you all again soon, I hope. Goodbye for now. Listening to Sun Crow, brought to you by Jerry Anderson with help from his fan club, Anderson. The series was produced for Radio 5 by Christopher Aldrich. Coming up next week on Thunderbirds, Terror in New York City. In all the years of my broadcasting, this must be the most breathtaking moment I have ever experienced. Hold everything. Something's gone wrong. The ground is cracking under the track. It's like an earth tremor beneath my feet. There is something wrong. The atomic motors are shutting down. We have just been ordered off this site by the police. There is, I understand, a very real danger that the entire building could collapse at any moment. We will be on the air again as soon as we have... That's next Monday, ETA 5 past 8 on Radio 5, FAB. This is BBC Radio 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. International Rescue are back on Radio 5. Thunderbirds are go. Thunderbird 1 and base from Thunderbird 2, under missile attack, fire! Are you okay, Virgil? Changing frequency to all that jammers. Fire! They're on check. They're coming straight for me. Washington, sir. Emergency call. The wheels have collapsed. The ground is packing under the track. Why can earth come beneath my feet? The Empire State Building has crashed into a mountain of rubble. Help! I'll have to go all the way by sea. Even if you made it, you'd only be in time to attend Ned Cook's funeral. <laughs> Tonight's episode, Terror in New York City, introduced by Thunderbird's mastermind, Jerry Anderson. As far as possible in Thunderbirds, we used to try and divide the stories so that each of the rescue craft was featured regularly. Thunderbird 1 was easy. After all, it was always the first to go. But try as we may, we nearly always ended up with all the Arthur Tracy boys crammed into Thunderbird 2 and leaving Thunderbird 3 and 4 back at base. One day, I read in a newspaper that a large store somewhere in Japan was in the way of a big road widening scheme. Because of its huge value as a going concern, it was not demolished, but miraculously shifted to a new position. It was jacked up and moved inch by inch to its new site. So 
how slow was the movement that customers continue to shop there throughout the operation. If this idea were to be the basis of a Thunderbird story, then, as always, it would have to be amplified. And so I decided we would move the Empire State Building in New York. And of course, if it were to be a Thunderbird story, there would have to be a disaster. But how do you justify a building built on solid rock toppling over? That's where the idea of an underground stream came from. An underground stream at last an opportunity to feature Thunderbird 4. But why wouldn't it be carried in Thunderbird 2? That would be the obvious thing to do. And so, Thunderbird 2 had to be disabled. We left that to the trigger-happy Americans. But as always in Thunderbirds, things turned out the right way up. The Americans made good by delivering Thunderbird 4 to New York without stealing its thunder, if you'll forgive the pun. So let's see what caused the terror in New York City. Thunderbird 1 and base from Thunderbird 2, under missile attack. Virgil, switch on the jammer. I think it's too late, Scott. Are you okay, Virgil? Come in, Thunderbird 2. Still here, Scott. Oh, that was close. They exploded right beneath me. Feels like I've got some damage on my tail unit. Trigger intercept the missile. For second attack. Five seconds. Changing frequency to combat oh. jammers. Three. Here we go again, Scott. Get that jammer working, Virgil. I'm catching up on you fast. They've changed frequency, Scott. They're unchecked. They're coming straight for me. Oh, hi there. Gordon Crazy speaking. Just listen to this. It's a video recording showing the start of yet another international rescue. The U.S. Navy super-secret strike vessel Sentinel had made a missile attack on Thunderbirds 1 and 2 when Scott and Virgil were returning from a mission. And Virgil in particular took quite a pasty. It seems the Navy had them secret for hostile craft. Washington, sir. Emergency call. I think the Sentinel commander. Stop attack immediately. Unidentified aircraft is a Thunderbird machine of the International Rescue Organization. Maybe. Missiles 5 and 6, destroy them. Thunderbird 2 from Thunderbird 1. Come in, Virgil. Will we be able to make it back to base? I'm not sure, Scott. Engines are running smoothly, but the tail section is giving trouble. It's just another 10 minutes. Now you'll make it, Virgil. I know you will. We're nearly home, Virgil. We're nearly home. Undercut down. Flaps down. Banking for final approach. Virgil, welcome back to the land of the living. Look, what 
happened to Thunderbird 2? Now, quit worrying about that. She was badly damaged, but she's going to be okay. There's nothing that a few weeks' work won't put right. A few weeks? But oh, that's terrible. Supposing she's needed on call. Well, let's hope she's not. Now, you relax. You need a lot of rest. <laughs> Hi, Virgil. Got your TV switched on? No, sir. I've seen enough TV to last me the rest of my life. Oh, but this is a special program. They're moving the Empire State Building. This I must say. You are about to witness, folks, one of the greatest pieces of engineering feats of all time. It's say that's Major Cook. You know, the guy had to stop filming us at the oil well. Yes, Scott. He'd do anything for a story. In a few moments, the national television broadcasting system will show you a construction job that leaves the building of the pyramids in the shade. Today, the Empire State Building here in New York City is going to be moved 200 yards. Not piece by piece, but as it stands, all 1,250 feet of it. First of all, we'll explain how this tremendous task is going to be performed. Sure would like to have been there today. Yeah, me too. Now, after tunneling under the foundations, hydraulic jacks were placed beneath the building. Then the jacks were raised, and up she came. The next step was to lay a heavy-duty track under the building and run it to the new site. Now, all that remains to be done is to move the giant building inch by inch to its new site. Wait for it. of my broadcasting, this must be the most breathtaking moment I have ever experienced. Hold everything. Something's gone wrong. The ground is cracking under the track. It's like an earth tremor beneath my feet. There is something wrong. The atomic motors are shutting down. ordered off this site by the police. There is, I understand, a very real danger that the entire building could collapse at any moment. We will be on the air again as soon as we have... seeing is the result of this terrifying tragedy. The Empire State Building has crashed into a mountain of rubble. It is no more. Help! Can you hear me? Help! That's that Cook's voice. He's still alive. One moment. It seems we have a miracle on our hands. That was Ned Cook's voice that we just heard. Well, how could anyone be alive under all that light? I don't know. But one thing's for sure. They'll never get him out. Now our equipment could do it, Father. We've got to get Thunderbird 2 there right away. Scott, you're forgetting. Thunderbird 2 is out of commission. There's nothing we can do. Ladies and gentlemen, Ned Cook is trapped under the ruins of the Empire State Building and is in touch with us via his radio microphone. We will be using this channel in order to maintain contact with him. All right, Ned Cook, can you hear me? I can hear you. Just before the building crashed, the ground collapsed beneath our feet. Then the building came down on top of us. Don't ask me why we weren't crushed. It was a miracle. We are now sitting in a hollow about 10 feet wide. We're not hurt, but I can hear water seeping in from below. Uh, of course. 
But that's the answer. The answer to what, Burns? Well, I, I, I've been trying to figure out uh, why that area should suddenly collapse. Uh, underground rivers. Underground rivers? Yes, Burns could be right. Many cities have rivers running beneath them. If there was a river uh, running under the uh, Empire State Building, uh, an undetected river, that, that could have caused the trouble. That means water will continue to seep into the hollow that's protecting Ned Cook. He'll drown. If only we could get along that river. That might be possible uh, with Thunderbird 4. But we can't have it to New York without Thunderbird 2. Then I'll have to go all the way by sea. Look, Gordon, your suggestion is not only dangerous, it's also highly impractical. Even if you made it, you'd only be in time to attend Ned Cook's funeral. Right now, I could get the commander of Sentinel... That's and it. That's it. The Sentinel. They put us out of action, they can put us back into action. I get the picture and I like it. Now, here's what we do. Scott, take off for New York. Yes, sir. Gordon, launch Thunderbird 4 using emergency procedure and then proceed to the position where the fleet exercises are going on. I'll contact Washington and arrange for them to pick you up and rush you to New York. Yes, sir. Good luck, Gordon. What can I do, Father? Go back to bed. So there it was. A rescue involving Thunderbird 4 and no Thunderbird 2 to get into the trouble zone. I used a passenger lift, which connected with a big Thunderbird 2 hangar, and boarded Thunderbird 4. I had to use my hover jets to get me to the scene. But then, of course, Thunderbird 4 was in its own element. As I made my way to meet up with Sentinel, Scott was already heading directly to New York City, aboard Thunderbird 1. This is Thunderbird 1 of International Rescue, calling New York. Come in, Empire State, Site Control. Site Control to Thunderbird 1. Boy, are we glad you guys are around. Is there any news of the trapped men? Well, we drilled a pilot hole to supply them with air, lighting, and food. Trouble is, the water level is rising. Right. I'll be arriving in under 30 minutes. I'll need detailed plans of the underground river systems. <laughs> Thunderbird 1 from Thunderbird 4. I have made contact with Sentinel. I'm being taken aboard. FAB, now what is your estimated time of arrival at Danger Zone? 24 hours, I'm afraid. Okay, good. I'll do the best you can. I, uh... I've been studying uh, Manhattan Island, uh, Mr. Tracy. Uh, its base is, is solid rock. Now, uh, underground streams d do exist, but they've never been considered a, a threat. What are you getting at, Brains? Well, no recent surveys ha have been carried out. It's going to be a, a difficult task to locate the river. I see. Already it's touch and go where the Thunderbird Four can arrive in time. And now the rescue could be delayed even further. Go ahead, Scott. Okay, Father, I'm here, and I'm set up. Now, here's the situation. Ned Cook and his cameraman are still alive. We can get food down to them, but the water is rising. Now, according to our calculations, they'll be under about the same time as Gordon arrives. Right, Scott. Here's what you do. Pass breathing apparatus down to them and keep them alive till Thunderbird 4 gets there. Hello, Ned. How are you feeling? Now, whatever happens, you stay with it. That's easy to say, buddy, but it's been nine hours since you got on the scene. I know, Ned. We're doing all we can. Sure. I'm sorry. Yes, this hanging about is getting me. We're so helpless. And the cold. The water's freezing. It is still rising. Yeah, it's coming up fast enough. At this rate, we have less than 10 hours. We'll be under around 10 a.m. New York to Sentinel. What is your ETA? We calculate 10 on 5 a.m., Scott. Well, that, uh, that's going to leave things pretty tight. 
Can you get more speed? Afraid not. We're at maximum speed now. Answer negative, Scott. Ten hours to New York it is. Okay, Gordon. Then I guess there's nothing we can do about it. Well, how about that breathing gear? Uh, we located some units at the Navy Yard. Well, that's something. Joe's in a bad way. This breathing water is getting him. We can't hold on. The water's up to our mouth. We'll have to wait. The mask. Put the masks on. Ned, can you hear me? Are you okay? Ned, come in. <coughs> it's okay. We've got the gear on. Now we've got to sit here and wait for our air to run out. We're slowing down. What's wrong? Well, we're approaching coastal limits. The Hudson and East Rivers are crammed with shipping. We can't possibly go any further at maximum speed. But wouldn't it be quicker in Thunderbird 4? Under the shipping? Much quicker. Okay. I'll take it from here. Sentinel to mobile control. Approaching New York. I am returning to Thunderbird 4. FAB, Gordon. When's your ETA now? I'll be near danger zone in 20 minutes. Hope I can find that river mouth. Uh, so do I. In 20 minutes, Ned and Joe run out of air. Well, it was up to Thunderbird 4 from here on in. I could expect little or no help from outside sources. Even the exact location of the underground river was uncertain. All I could do was try. So I carried out final equipment checks while the Sentinel crew prepared to lure Thunderbird 4 into the waters of the harbor. Down and down I went until I was under the busy shipping lanes. Then it was full speed ahead, and a race against time. Mobile control to Thunderbird 4. Moving towards East River Estuary now. Thunderbird 4 is on its way, Ned. How's the air going? Too fast for my liking. I found it, Scott. I'm moving upstream. So far, we're in luck. It's big enough for navigation. Sir, there's a message just come in from Central Control. It's pretty serious, I'm afraid. Now, what's their problem? The land subsidence is spreading. It looks like the Fulmer Finance building is in danger now. It could go over as well. Fulmer Finance? Thunderbird 4 from Rescue Control. Gordon, do you hear me? Loud and clear, Scott. No sign of these fellows as yet. Gordon, now listen. You've got to locate them within the next... Two minutes. There's another building up here that's going to collapse. And the impact could cave in the whole area where those guys are swimming. The air of the gauge is empty. And Jay's in a bad way. But don't panic. There's probably still some air left in those tanks. We found it. There's just enough room to get through. Come on, Joe. Swing. I come to a wall of rock. It's a dead end. Uh, uh, hold it. No. It's a sharp bend. The tunnel goes off to the right. Just a few more seconds. Ned, you've got to keep going. Search for Thunderbird 4's beacon. Look out for a beacon. Ned! Joe! Swim! Joe! They found it! Okay, I got the 
right now. Be it, Gordon. Get the heck out of there. It didn't seem possible, but we made it. I was convinced we might well have to chalk up our first failure during that rescue. Time was against us right from the start. However, I'm happy to say that Thunderbird 2 is now back in service and packed with improvements. So we are once again at full strength and ready to move whenever we get that distress call. Well, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the adventure. See you next time. F.A.B. City, brought to you by Jerry Anderson. The series was produced for Radio 5 by Christopher Aldrich. Coming up next week on Thunderbirds, Ricochet. Ricochet. Are you hurt? No, I'm okay. What happened? I don't know. Was it a meteorite? No, it was some sort of explosion. I'll have to check. You worry too much. I still think I should go outside and take a look. You can. We're on the air in two minutes. Now, you listen to me. We're in serious trouble. We've moved in orbit. You mean we're heading for the Earth? Yeah. But okay, we land. What's the problem? We're built for re-entry. We had to come down sometime anyway. Not without breaking parachutes. Look. So? So there's nothing to slow us down. We're heading for re-entry and annihilation. That's next Monday. ETA 5 past 8 on Radio 5. F.A.B.